Hi, I'm Kyle. If you're a relatively new full-time faculty, you might not know me, but for about three years, I worked in what was called the cafe as the primary DC Connect trainer. I've been full-time faculty in the computer programming and analysis program, and I want to do a little discussion of some approaches and thoughts related to UDL in my courses. Uh, note that while I've done a fair bit of reading on the subject, this presentation is strictly anecdotal. I have been told that the main thing to focus on for your benefit is allowing multiple means of expression for your students. Allowing people to communicate their learning in different ways is great, but I also want to keep in mind that programmers sort of need to be able to write programs. Given that this is a video, I frankly have no idea who I'm talking to. But supposing you aren't a programmer, I wonder what your perceptions of what a programmer are. Picture a programmer. What are they doing? What aren't they doing? Unless you work closely with IT people, it's probably hard to know what programmers really do. I mean, for me, as a non-carpenter, I think of carpenters as always doing carpenting. You know, they're measuring and cutting and gluing and affixing. Is there more to it? There's got to be, but I don't really have any idea. And accountants. I have no idea what accountants are really doing, but I can picture them writing in a ledger with rows of numbers, and some of the numbers are in parentheses because they're negative and whatnot. But that isn't actually what they're spending all their time on, is it? Now, maybe my oversimplified view of things outside my own world are startlingly accurate, but I doubt it. <laughs> We've got to keep in mind that our graduating students aren't doing just one thing, so we can't assess them on just one thing. What are my programmers actually doing? They're reading about existing systems. They're making diagrams related to processes. They're drawing mock-ups of user interfaces. They're talking to clients to learn what they need. They're planning out complex database systems. They're learning new programming languages all the time. They're explaining their code to a colleague. They're looking up how a particular function works. They're fixing errors in existing code. They're presenting proposals and applications to current or prospective clients. They're running tests on current applications and reporting on it. And yes, sometimes they are writing programming code. This isn't even an exhaustive list but most programmers do every single one of these, at least occasionally. Some things my graduates are never doing are answering multiple choice or fill in the blank questions. Unless they go into a degree program, but I'm going to disregard that. Okay, so far this went from me introducing myself to talking about what my graduating students might be doing. You can probably draw the connection here and you've likely already discussed this concept within the scope of the course you're in. But what I'm getting at is authentic assessment. It tends to be that those strict regimented testing styles that many people of my generation or earlier grew up with are based around something that nobody does in any job ever. But if we think of what is going to be required of our students, we can think of a rather robust list of necessary tasks that can help us inform the various means of expression that are reasonable for our assessments. My programming students need to code, and that's more or less essential no matter how universal my design is. But they also need to emphasize rapid information lookup, asking effective questions, explaining their work, drawing diagrams, and revising things. I can build these into nearly all of my assessments. Even if there's an essential skill, this breaks things up and it provides practice for my students on other important parts of their professional skill set. Some of my predecessors in, in my program team have insisted that we keep some form of structured testing in the program. I've heard different arguments for this, and I won't address that all here, but I will say I do have quizzes in some of my courses. I've done everything I can to eliminate the stress of quizzes. Time limits are generous. The weight is low, but it's a good time to check that students can state some kind of understanding of key concepts. I don't police what they look at. Uh, the quizzes are fully open resource, and I embrace that. If the students can look up an answer, either that's what I want them to do, or I've made a bad question. Generally, at least part of each quiz asks them to explain something in a written format. I'll admit this is partly a language-based challenge, but I'm, all I'm looking for is their explanation. I don't grade them on spelling and grammar, as long as it's comprehensible. I get rid of larger tests entirely. Large tests are stressful. They don't demonstrate applicable skills. They don't exist in the workplace. They are not useful content checkpoints. Tests offer zero benefit for my students. I would accept that some courses could benefit from strict tests, though, uh, perhaps for fields that actually have certification exams. Preparing students for that is not a bad thing. Anyway, approaching quizzes this way, I get to measure their skill with looking things up, 
and explaining code. Being able to speak intelligently about their work is, well, it's a hard skill to define besides modeling it in class, as we do. It's maybe somewhat challenging to assess. Unlike a piece of code, there's no objective success. Uh, still, our program advisory committee, our PAC, has strongly urged that we have graduates who can intelligently discuss their practice. If they just hand in a piece of work and they're done with it, we would never know. Thus, we've started to use reflective statements to give students a chance to discuss things. In some courses, like Prog 1205 and VBAS 6206, at least right now, these are written statements where they talk about how a quiz went. Some example questions are listed here. The first one, does your score on the quiz accurately reflect how much you know about this topic, why or why not, gives good students who had a bad quiz result a chance to really make the case that they know better. And you know that students have always wanted that opportunity, right? Typically, we tell them to answer three questions from a list of five or so. In Prog 1205, we give 25% of their grade for the quiz result and 75% of their grade for just the explanation, but I could see the argument for shifting that a bit. This type of reflective exercise allows me to see how they're doing with learning the language, with looking things up, with explaining code, and with how they communicate about it. On the same note, we have easy access to excellent tools for video recording now, including Microsoft Teams and Flipgrid being available for all students. Thus, I have my students prepare a video where they display their programming assignments and talk about them. Again, being able to explain your work to someone is requested by our pack. And code reviews are a normal thing in industry. If I only accepted a student's finished work and gave them a grade on it, they would never develop this skill. My students have spoken really fondly about this practice, in part because, as they say, usually once a piece of work is done, it's gone, and you forget about it. But if someone asks you to talk about it, you think about what you've done and what you've learned from it. For some students who hate this kind of thing, I've occasionally made exceptions to them having to prepare a video. It's not for everyone. Again, I focus on the key outcomes and that's all I'm grading. I make a point of telling my students that sending a video of themselves explaining things is a useful skill in modern times. As another minor bonus, it is completely impossible to plagiarize a reflective video. In addition to the other kinds of professional outcomes this reflective practice demonstrates, I also get to hear how they would present material to a client or a peer. There are times when the assignment is a pretty traditional academic or professionally styled paper. The first thing I do, and it's not strictly UDL, but it's not emphasizing the spelling and the grammar, because we have communications courses and those have already done this. I put somewhat of a catch-all grade in there for professionalism, but what I really want to get out of this paper is demonstrated understanding. My students aren't usually writing papers in the workforce, after all. Since I'm focusing on demonstrated understanding, I'll accept these papers as audio or video recordings as well. As a guideline, uh, they say it takes a minute to say 150 words on average. So if you wanted a thousand words, it would be uh, six and two thirds minutes. This won't work for every written assignment, but in a lot of contexts, there's no downside to this. Whatever format they provide their paper in, they've practiced communicating professionally and explaining complex things like database relationships. My students really do need to write code to be programmers. It's important for my students to hand in a piece of code and get a grade on it. But there are different things you have to do to write a program effectively, and that includes planning it and fixing it. The plan is sometimes written out and sometimes involves a drawing of an application or a flowchart that shows how it works. So we include that in the grading. By including the important preparatory steps and not strictly a product, we assess many more useful job skills and the students arguably develop these more effectively. Look at all the things they've demonstrated on every major programming assignment. I should also say that, in many cases, we build in an opportunity to fix up and resubmit existing work. There are good reasons you might not do this in every field. Uh, I would love for an electrician or a nurse or a chemical engineer to generally get things done right on the first, on the first try. But computer programming is revisionist by its nature. Plus, we get to see them fix errors, and they learn from that. I've only discussed assessments from three computer programming courses so far. It's really easy to think of a programmer just programming. But look at all of the skills they've demonstrated, and look at all of the different ways they can demonstrate them. It's easy to envision the ideas behind UDL as providing and accepting everything in a written, visual, and auditory format. And that's a good thing. But it's not like we want to pass an accountant who can't add numbers, or a carpenter who can't... Carpent? When there's a completely essential requirement, like carpentry, you can't just accept interpretive dance when you've asked for a cabinet or something. However, don't oversimplify the work that your students are doing. 
If there's something they do to prepare for that key deliverable, build that into the grading and consider whether you can accept that preparation in various formats. If there's a way you can have a student explain or revise their work, include that too. In some cases, this might sound like a lot of work to grade, but if you get creative, you can probably make it happen. Talk to some colleagues and surely someone will have a magnificent idea related to this. For one thing, consider just using your class time for assessment, since this type of assessment is inherently instructional. These multifaceted assessments can really help students with identifying their strengths and deficits, and that can help build in other employment skills. In programming, some people realize they aren't well suited to client interactions, and they can either try to develop that skill or seek employment that doesn't have direct client interaction. Some students have realized they do better with client interactions and plans and diagrams and documentation than they actually do with the code itself. They find themselves focusing on an IT project management role. Including assessments that incorporate the full work experience that allow multiple means of expressions allows your students to explore and to specialize. You'll give more people opportunities to show their strengths, and I think you'll see those strengths in your graduates.